Well, good morning, church. Welcome to another daily Bible reading. Let me go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and this time that we have in your word. Uh, bless this time. Be with us. Allow us to grow in our knowledge of your word and your purpose for us. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, let's take a look at our passage for this morning. We've got Isaiah chapters 23 to 25, as well as 1 Corinthians 3. And as we take a look at Isaiah chapter 23, we have a prophecy here for Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are two um, regions that were often um, a temptation to Israel. And we see the judgment that's coming upon them here in verse 1, the oracle considering concerning Tyre. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed without house or harbor. It is reported to them from the land of Cyprus. Now, Tyre was one of the cities that was out on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, so they did a lot of commerce um, over the seas with their vessels. Verse 2, Be silent, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon, you messengers, your messengers cross the sea. And were on many waters, the grain of the Nile, the harvest of the river was her revenue, and she was the market of nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea speaks, the stronghold of the sea, saying, I have neither tra travailed nor given birth. I have neither brought up young men nor reared virgins. When the report reaches Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report of Tyre. Pass over to Tarshish, wail, O inhabitants of the coastland. Is this your jubilant city, whose origin is from antiquity, whose feet used to carry her to colonize distant places? Who has planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were honored of the earth? So we see here just in these verses just how prosperous um, these two um, cities were. And verse 9, the Lord of hosts has planned it to defile the pride of all beauty, to despise all the honored of the earth. Overflow your land like the Nile, O daughters, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more restraint. He has stretched his hand out over the sea. He has made the kingdoms tremble. The Lord has given command concerning Canaan to demolish its strongholds. He has said, you shall exalt no more, O crushed virgin daughter of Sidon. Arise, pass over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. Behold the land of the Chaldeans and the Chaldeans um, that, that was in Babylon. This is the people which was not. Assyria appointed it for desert creatures. They erected their siege towers. They stripped its palaces. They made it for ruin. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is destroyed. So the Chaldeans are the one that's going to come and destroy them. And then we go to verse 15, and we see a change after 70 years. Now in that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, like the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. Take your harp, walk about the city, O forgotten harlot, pluck the strings skillfully, sing many songs, that you may be remembered. It will come about at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. Then she will go back to her harlot's wages and will play the harlot with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Her gain and her harlot's wages will be set apart to the Lord. It will not be stored up or hoarded, but her grain will become sufficient food and choice attire for those who dwell in the presence of the Lord. So it sounds like here Tyre is going to be restored, but they're going to go back to their old ways of harlotry. Um, and they're going to be a temptation to the nations, but the wages that they get from it won't be used by them. It's actually going to be used for the Lord and his kingdom. And in chapter 24, we see the judgment that's going to come on the earth before the kingdom is established. Verse 1, Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh. 
The gaiety of tambourine ceases, the noise of revelers stop, the gaiety of the harp ceases. They do not drink with they do not drink wine with strong. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may enter. There is an outcry in the streets concerning the wine. All joy turns to gloom. The gaiety of the earth is banished. The desolation, desolation is left in the city and the gate is battered to ruins. And thus it will be in the midst of the earth among the peoples as the shaking of an olive tree, as the gleanings when the grape harvest is over. So we see the description here of the judgment, uh, the destruction that's going to come really upon all the earth as the Lord returns. And verse 14, we will see celebrating from the remnant um, who um, are, are there, the righteous, the, the righteous remnant um, who are remaining. Verse 14, they raise their voices, they shout for joy, they cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord, therefore glorify the Lord in the east. The name of the Lord, the God of Israel in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear songs, glory to the righteous one. But then we see Isaiah, in spite of this singing, he is not singing with them, but he is still pronouncing woe. In fact, woe to me, woe to me, because he still has these visions of destruction in his head. But I say, woe to me, woe to me, alas for me, the treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare, for the windows above are opened and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a rock, for its transgressions his, its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fail never to rise again. So it will be in that day, verse 21, that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the king of the earth on earth, the kings of the earth on earth. So we see judgment here both in the heavens and the earth and the judgment um, in the heavens, the host of heaven on high. I believe these would be really the, the, the fallen angels, the the, the demons, demon spirits that um, are out there in verse 22, they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. And then verse 25, we see praise to the Lord for this coming kingdom. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you have made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin. A palace of strangers is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. For you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. Like heat in drought, you, have, uh, you subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. And then verse 6, we see the banquet. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all the peoples, even the veil that is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces. He will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And by the way, right there in verse 8, he will swallow up death for all time. I believe this is very spiritual in the nature of its promise. This is eternal life being given right here, being discussed right here in the Old Testament. Um, there are many who say that uh, the Old Testament doesn't speak of heaven, doesn't speak of eternal life. But I believe verses like this show us that it actually does. Verse 9, it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, 
and Moab will be trodden down in, in his place, as straw is trodden down in the water of a manure pile. And he will spread out his hands in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pride together with the trickery of his hands. The unassailable fortification of your walls he will bring down. Lay low and cast to the ground, even to the dust. And so that brings us to the New Testament as we're looking at 1 Corinthians 3. And remember that chapters 1 and 2, Paul has been talking about really the wisdom of God. And he opened up chapter 1, speaking out against the division that had existed amongst the people and goes to make an argument that the gospel is the wisdom of God. And really, there is no reason for that division. God's the one that should get all the credit. Um, and we see that here in verses 1 um, onward to verse 9, as Paul talks about the ministry um, that him and people like Apollos have served for the Lord. Verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. For you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? For what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed and even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So in other words, there really is no reason for this division. There is no reason to put pride in men. Our pride is in the Lord alone. And Paul actually had said that at the end of um, chapter 2 <clears throat> that we read yesterday. And then going to verse 10, According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master, builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, verse 13 says, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built up on it remains, he will receive a reward. <clears throat> but if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So this is not talking about believers versus unbelievers, but this is talking about all believers and the foundation that is laid and what's put on that foundation and the reward that we await in the future when we go to heaven. That those of us who have been fruitful for the Lord that have built on that foundation a, a sturdy, um, sturdy sturdiness, let's just say that what whatever is being built is able to withstand the trials of this fire that is being described by the Lord um, will receive a reward, but the ones who don't, um, they, they won't. And of course, we can say that being in heaven is certainly a tremendous reward in and of itself. This is talking about something above that. And I would say that because of verse 15, it says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And then we see verse 16, the reminder to us that as we've been talking about building over this foundation, that we indeed are the temple of God. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. So all of us as saints, all of us are as believers, we are considered holy. In fact, that is the meaning of the word saints, holy ones. And then we get to verse 18 and this reminder that wisdom belongs to God. Verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. 
all things belong to you. You belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. And that there is the basis for unity. There's no purpose or reason for division because all the people that have been given to us by God belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So ultimately we are united in Christ and reconciled to God. Well, that brings us to the end of our reading for this morning and to the end of another week of our daily Bible reading. Let me go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for just providing us your wisdom. And I pray that you would use your wisdom to continue to grow the church of your son, Jesus Christ, help protect us physically and spiritually. And Father, I pray that as we come together tomorrow morning for worship, that your name would be glorified. And Father, we give thanks to you and pray these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. I certainly look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning, whether in person or virtually. And just as a reminder, we are indeed open. And last Sunday, I was pleased to see our biggest turnout in quite a while. Um, so if you're available and uh, feel, feel like you want to worship with us in person, please do. Otherwise, we'll see you online. We'll have a wonderful rest of the day and God bless.